Maybe I start with the definition. A park is a distinct territory that appears natural, but is not productive, right? It was called the Garden of Eden, not the Park of Eden, because in a park, you can go hungry. So if today we could say the rest of the world is valuable because it can be built on or dug up, then parks are the fortunate places, the only natural resource that is valuable because it appears undeveloped. I like this definition because it makes the industrialist and the landscape architect into the same thing. They both turn nature into something consumable. Sigmund Freud called parks a fantasy. He said that they perform a function for society like fantasies do for individuals. So when agriculture or industry or a city threaten to change the earth into something unrecognizable, we create reservations. These places maintain the old condition of things, which has been regrettably sacrificed to necessity everywhere else. And in these reservations, everything is permitted to grow and spread. Well, that's the idea, right? In an age of environmental and economic crisis, they call for new forms of cities. Do we also need new forms of parks? What happens to our idea of the city without parks? What new possibilities might emerge if we get rid of parks as we know them today? So we've invited some special guests to debate the proposition, would we be better off without parks? They come from a variety of backgrounds, from public health to landscape architecture, conservation, to urban design. And so we're going to hear arguments from different perspectives, with different values and different criteria, and two different benches. Team Yes Parks and Team No Parks. The relationship between green and us has fundamentally changed. Whereas before we were surrounded by green, now we surround small patches of green. And parks have become not unlike zoos. Like zoos, they emerged when people were becoming more and more removed from the wild. And like zoos, they seek to reinsert a simulation of the wild back into the city. And instead of inserting a simulated uh, nature that doesn't actually work uh, into the city, at Urban Lab, we're thinking about expanding what green is and what it can do. We're proposing to insert ecologically-based infrastructure into the city by going beyond 20th century zoning, by rejecting uh, 20th century separation of programs, by hybridizing, we seek to leverage infrastructure, landscape, and architecture for new ways to live in the city. So there's no denying, I think, that park forms have changed, that over time, um, they've gone from things that were much more natural to things that are much less so, that have natural elements, but that are highly actively managed in a human way. But the question, I think, before us is, should we get rid of them altogether? And I would argue that, no, we shouldn't. And from a health standpoint, I'd like to show you some statistics and some evidence that suggests we should maintain parks as a necessary, albeit not sufficient, solution to the, to the health issues. Prior to the creation of Central Park, for example, um, people who were wealthy could very well have courtyards, right? But people who were living in crowded conditions, at the time, some of those crowded living conditions, some of those buildings had no windows, had no ventilation, and so the only available space to get sunshine and fresh air was this public amenity. Today, we've got a different set of diseases, right? Um, we've done a really good job, actually, at um, improving infectious diseases resulting from crowding, from sanitation. So those infrastructures really worked. Issues like tuberculosis are actually now at very low levels. But we've replaced them now. They've been replaced with a new set of diseases, chronic diseases like heart disease and strokes, diabetes, cancers, are now the leading causes of death in the world. But Canada's national parks have served and continue to serve a much darker purpose, the dispossession of the lands of indigenous peoples. In the name of conservation, but as part of a much more fundamental hunger for the land, the Canadian and provincial governments have for the last 130 years sought to create protected and uninhabited areas, justifying in their eyes either the expulsion of indigenous peoples or the maintenance of control of their territory. And so I'd like to suggest that in this age of supposed reconciliation, it is now time to return these lands to indigenous peoples and to imagine the benefits that this would bring to all of us. We have to stop demanding that those who have cared longest and best for these lands must sacrifice their rights for the sake of their destruction.
The good news is that when indigenous peoples control more territory, we all benefit. It's not in parks, after all, that you will find the greatest biological diversity. You will find that in lands controlled and stewarded by local peoples, especially indigenous ones. National parks apparently cover an area of 300,000 square kilometers in this country. So that's 3% 3, 3 of our land mass. How much land, how much land do indigenous peoples have in this country? 0.2%. Zero, 0 so in other words, all, their, all the reservation land could be fit into a single park in Yukon or Nunavut. Um, and if we want to have any semblance of justice in this country, um, it will have to involve land restitution. So take those 3% and hand them back to their rightful owners. Abolish parks. The point simply is that national parks and any equivalent to a national park is there to conserve nature as a priority. We have gone through, are going through an Anthropocene, an century where humans have become the drivers of change. Uh, geologically speaking, we are beginning to see plastics everywhere. Uh, we're beginning to see the elimination of uh, biodiversity. Uh, fundamentally, we are the cause of the problems. And the national parks stand as icons, if you will, of, of what we could do if we were actually much more <coughs> better stewards of, of this planet. While biodiversity is important, I wanted to also touch on a couple of other things that are really critical to understand why protected areas are important. Globally, out of the 100th largest cities in the world, 33 get their water from protected areas. In New York City, for example, instead of building a huge water plant, acquired land in the Catskills, protected it, and now has a source of water that doesn't require to be filtered. So besides the water, there's also food, uh, sources of food. Certainly in Canada, perhaps we don't have as much of that in the context of perhaps uh, Peru, where they have a, a park dedicated to protecting 600 species, 600 varieties of potatoes. They have, have an actual national, internationally recognized potato national park. So it essentially recognizes that it is only through this mechanism that we actually can assure ourselves that the strains of, of past uh, developments uh, are not lost. Uh, yes, people are politically trained much better than our do-gooders here for no parks, no? So they know how to sell their stuff, no? As I'm a landscape architect, um, we turn to think also about landscape and parks, let's say, in a less nostalgic way, you know, it's what we deal with every day. It's like a surgeon, you know, a surgeon is used to open bodies every day and grab hearts with his hand or, or, or worse things, you know? So he's not nostalgic about the heart or thinks of the heart as, oh my goodness, I am so in love, my heart hurts. If we think of the whole world as one park, what happens actually to the, to the parks that we are used to as a typology in the cities? Parks are totally about war, you know, it's a constant war against animals, insects, plants, you know, whatever you, you will talk about. But the, the, what we sell is like the same fake like in Canada. It's all destroying, but you, you show us it would be totally peaceful and totally nice. Public spaces, in the best of the cases, and parks maybe as, uh, as, the, as the biggest of these, uh, of these spaces, allow and encourage cultivated conflicts, okay, instead of avoiding them. The word park is holding us back. So I would say friction space or hybrid or something that expands the possibility. Because I think the word park uh, has too much historical baggage. And how can you move past that? Of course, I like going to parks. Um, <laughs> but no, no, you're not supposed to say that. Don't say that. I would like more. I would that. like more to go to a friction space or a hybridized landscape that could do more, that could address the, c the contemporary issues of our time. I think these intersections are actually really important. Um, like in New York, um, you know, you have bike pathways and pedestrian pathways that are separated. Uh, they might be next to a big street, but they're a separated path. And they're actually called greenways and they are managed by the Parks Department. They're colored green. <laughs> and they're colored green sometimes. But they don't right? actually but, yeah. do anything more than allow bikes. Yeah. But, but these are, you know, I think these hybrids that you're talking about that can actually function concurrently as pathways of recreation and transportation are, I think, an important piece, right? The, the connecting of the dots 
so that we're not constantly separating uses. There are opportunities for us to think more in our physical environments as well about making them more porous and more connected and more hybrids as opposed to segregated uses, right? Connectivity that would allow um, people to uh, really uh, meet their complete needs by moving freely, and usually th that kind of proximal movement allows for physical activity and human, human scale movement to occur. Yeah. Two things. One, we are all going to die, <laughs> okay? So to make that point, no? so this kind of American positivism that you cannot uh, get rid of any health issues, that, that's uh, uh, probably uh, financed by Pfister or someone else. So that's not going to happen. So uh, nature will always find diseases for us. Yeah? So too much positivism is not good. And parks, is, that's one of the problems of parks is that. But what you said I think is very valuable and, uh, or the, this combination of your discussion uh, now and the idea of hybridization because in the end it's not only the park as a term or, or as a typology that is in crisis. Many other typologies are as well. So, because you were talking about shops, no? People are uh, ordering more and more stuff uh, through internet. The shopping malls are in, in, in crisis. You know, the big American invention of space is in crisis because people don't go there anymore. They prefer to get their stuff delivered. So, what does it mean for the walkable city where you would be searching for goods? So, in the end, we have to rethink a lot of, uh, of typologies. What is a street? What is, what is walking? Uh, what is also moving with self-driving cars? What would it mean that for the, maybe the self-driving cars don't park anymore in the city, so the, the parking space is free then suddenly, you know? So there are so many issues that have to do with this connectivity that the park is actually only one of them, but maybe uh, because it's kind of so, in this kind of dreamy space, and not so clearly functional, but in the end it is a, a functional bit of the, of the system. It's not out of the system. It would be nice if it could be. It would be nice if the promise of the dream would come true and you could go in a park and really restore yourself uh, and do a kind of a restart of, 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 of the whole thing, but it's not true. We fucked it up already. It's not that we have the chance to save it. We have just the chance to, to, uh, to make it working better. You know, but to make it working better, we have to use our technical uh, possibilities. So we have to be much more functional the way we look at it and, and less uh, romantic and less nostalgic. That doesn't help anymore, I think, because that just covers the real problems, you know, is what we are saying. Isn't the park actually covering the problem? Because if you want people to walk, just get rid of cars, you know what I mean, or, or, or close the metro. I think we're, we're quibbling over sort of definitions and over stewardship, right? Um, of sort of these protected lands or l these, you know, green spaces, albeit not completely natural as they once were, um, albeit, you know, with uh, the potential for better designs, for better integration with the rest of the community, et cetera. But there seems to be consensus that we like these spaces, right? However we, whatever we call them. Right now we call them park. We might need to tweak our definitions. We might need to expand them. We might need to think about how we steward them or who stewards them. It's so much more complex, these things, no? And parks is just one, one bit of this, of these things. And maybe that we like it, that's the other thing, that we all like it, me too, by the way. Doesn't mean that, um, that we, we also like unhealthy food. We like a lot of things that are not good for us, you know? That we like something is not actually a quality uh, security for quality or for something that does us good. So we have to always question ourselves, is this something that we uh, can allow us to like the way we used to do it? Uh, is, is it right? Is it healthy for us? And this is something that does over time change. Uh, let's try it with clapping. Make some noise if you're for no parks. Okay. okay, now make some noise for Yes Parks. <laughs> I'll take a time. Well, okay. They're louder. They're louder. <laughs> but there's less of that. Yeah. It's fantastic. There's, there's no winner because there's no prize, anyway. But, um, you didn't tell us. But that. I'm very impressed that we managed to split the yeah. room. So we'll take it. Yeah, well, uh, that's, <laughs> that's, we're gonna that's do. great. We were, uh, we were outnumbered, though. Three yes, to two. exactly. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming.